Hey there, I'm Jake the Ashen Hollow, and I hope each of you is having a fantastic day. So this is probably the longest and hardest I've pondered on a theory so far. It's been evident to most people who have played Dark Souls 3 that there was some sort of war in Lothric, most even say it to have been a civil war. Though while it may be obvious it occurred, it's hard to pinpoint each side, their players, and their motives. So after countless hours of staring at item descriptions, staring at walls and various other objects, scouring the web and talking to the fine people in my Discord, I think I may have it all figured out, at least in my opinion of the interpretations. Alright, let's start with naming each faction of Lothric that could participate in this war. There's the Royal Family, the Three Pillars of Lothric, the Knight, the Scholar, and the High Priestess, and the Secret Pillar, the Hunters, or the Black Hand. Now, Civil War obviously means they were fighting among themselves, whether it was between certain pillars or members within each pillar disagreeing or what have you, is to be determined. Let's look at what we can see when we enter the plaza at the High Wall of Lothric. We see the remnants of a battle between Winged Knights and Lothric Knights. The Winged Knights are donning blue tabards, and the Lothric Knights red. So it seems we got a classic red versus blue thing going on here. But that isn't the only interesting thing to note at the High Wall, though. We also see a Lothric Knight in a blue tabard, standing over slain Lothric Knights in red. So would it appear it's not just the Winged Knights fighting Lothric Knights, but rather the Lothric Knights themselves are divided. Based only on this information, let's determine the sides and what they could be fighting for. The Winged Knight armor says, Armor of the Winged Knights who swore themselves to the angels. Worship of the Divine Messengers was viewed as heresy in Lothric and unrecognized by any of the Three Pillars of Rule. This is believed to be why Gertrude, the Heavenly Daughter, was imprisoned in the lofty cell above the Grand Archives. So the Winged Knights fight for the angels. The Ringed City DLC revealed to us that the angels come from the Londor Pilgrims, and Londor was of course an advocate for ending the Age of Fire. The Lothric Knight armor says, Armor of a celebrated Lothric Knight. The Knight has served as one of the three pillars since ancient times, and shares the Wyvern as a symbol of Lothric. So the Lothric Knights, or at least a majority of them, served the three pillars, which are the foundation for Lothric. And Lothric, as we know, is all about creating a worthy heir to the flame to keep the Age of Fire alive. So here we find the contrast between the two sides, one for fire, one for dark, essentially. Simple, sure, but it gets a lot more complicated than that. For starters, we can likely deduce that not everyone in any of the pillars agreed with the mission statement of Lothric, and went to advocate for ending the Age of Fire instead, hence the blue Lothric knights killing the ones in red. Now let's explore the founding of faith that drove those to oppose the religion the Way of White established in Lothric. Divine Pillars of Light says, Miracle of Gertrude the Heavenly Daughter. The Queen's Holy Maiden Gertrude was visited by an angel who revealed this tale to her. Despite losing both her sight and voice, she was determined to record the tale. Ordinary men cannot decipher her fragmentary scrawl, nor to comprehend how it became the foundation of the angelic faith of Lothric. So an angel appeared to Gertrude and thus began the angelic faith. And it is important to note that it says the angelic faith of Lothric because these two religions directly opposing each other in the same kingdom can easily be a cause for war. So I think it is important to determine who Gertrude and the Queen are in Lothric. The most common theory is that Guinevere, the one and only Princess of Sunlight herself, is the Queen of Lothric and that Gertrude is her daughter, and I completely agree. But if you haven't heard that yet, or perhaps aren't sold on the idea, let me explain why it makes sense. So this will be a little bit of a rabbit trail in regards to talking about the Civil War itself, but it is a completely necessary rabbit trail to understand the major players and their motives. So let's start with reading the description for the Divine Blessing back in Dark Souls 1. Holy water from Goddess Guinevere. The Goddess of Sunlight Guinevere, daughter of the Great Lord of Sunlight Gwyn, is cherished by all as the symbol of bounty and fertility. Alright, two things here. This is Guinevere's holy water. She is the sole creator of the Divine Blessing. And she is the symbol and slash or goddess of bounty and fertility. These are important to note as we read the description for the Divine Blessing in Dark Souls 3. 
It says, Holy water blessed by the Queen of Lothric. The Queen of Lothric married to the former King Osirios was initially revered as the goddess of fertility and bounty. After giving birth to Ocelot, her youngest, she quietly disappeared. Basically almost the same thing, right? It's the Queen of Lothric's holy water. This queen, who was initially revered as a goddess of bounty and fertility. That's pretty cut and dry right there. And I've heard some people say that the Queen of Lothric couldn't be Guinevere simply due to the fact that she couldn't live that long, which strikes me as odd considering during these same events of Dark Souls 3, her older brother is alive and kicking. Kicking quite hard, might I add. But if that isn't enough for you, there is another piece of evidence I can provide. The Bountiful Light Miracle reads, Miracle taught to knights by Gertrude, holy maiden to the queen, the heavenly daughter is said to be the queen's child. So here we can confirm that Gertrude is the queen or Guinevere's child, and also that she is her maiden, which was quite a customary thing for a queen to have her daughter as her maidens. There is another character in Lothric many believe is also Guinevere's daughter, and for good reason, and that's the dancer. From the dancer's soul, you can transpose the soothing sunlight miracle, which says, Special miracle granted to the maidens of the Princess of Sunlight. The miracles of Guinevere, the princess cherished by all, bestow their blessings on a great many warriors. So this other daughter is also the queen's maiden, but in this description it explicitly states maiden of the Princess of Sunlight. Now why would it make sense to say that she's a maiden to the Princess of Sunlight if the queen wasn't Guinevere? Why would it mention Guinevere at all if that wasn't the case? Especially considering that the dancer's armor states, Crown worn by the dancer of the Boreal Valley, the mirage-like aurora veil is said to be an article of the old gods permitted only for direct descendants of the old royal family. So the dancer being a direct descendant to the old royal family, aka Gwyn, the firstborn, Guinevere, etc. Her soul also says, the Pontiff Sullivan bestowed a double slashing sword upon a distant daughter of the formal royal family, ordering her to serve first as a dancer and then as an outrider knight, the equivalent to exile. The Sun Princess Ring also states that Guinevere left her home with a great many other deities and became a wife and mother raising several heavenly children. So Guinevere being the Queen of Lothric makes more sense than anything else. Okay, Jake, that's fucking cool and all, but what does that have to do with anything? That's a great question, other Jake. I'm glad you asked. Now let me tell you. Now the revelation of the dancer being a distant daughter is peculiar. Now I don't think it means distant as in relation. Everyone does have distant relatives, third, fourth, fifth cousins, twice removed, and the likes. But a daughter isn't distant at all. I think it means distant here as in perhaps Guinevere and her daughter dances for money didn't quite get along, thus she remained distant from her mother. So hang on to that and hang on to the part of the divine blessing that said the queen quietly disappeared, specifically the quietly part as I believe they are both symbolic as I will reveal what I believe happened to Guinevere. She had a change of heart, a complete 180 wasn't going to advocate the Age of Fire anymore, but shit was crazy in Lothric, her daughter Gertrude was branded as a heretic for her involvement in the angelic faith, so Guinevere changed who she was entirely. Guinevere was reborn, I guess is the appropriate word for telling you that Guinevere decided to go by the name Rosaria. Now let me explain why that makes sense. First off, going from being the goddess of fertility to the mother of rebirth isn't really that far off. And of course it's logical to believe that the mother of rebirth herself, who can change people's appearances, can do so to herself, and explains why she doesn't look like the Guinevere we remember. Now let's talk about all the symbols of fertility we find around her bedchambers and the cathedral. First is the cribs, which aren't used for the rebirths themselves, as we aren't rebirthed as children. This mural in particular found on the outside wall of her chambers with the goat and the satyr are both age-old symbols of fertility, and I don't think it's far off to assume that the abundance of flowers in the middle could represent bounty. Not to mention the very uterus-esque ribbons on the side. 
Then there's this oak branch, abundant with acorns, which could represent bounty, but also acorns are another symbol of fertility. And of course, you'll note again the uterus-esque ribbons. Then there's the fact that when Leonard takes Rosaria's soul, he's found in the room of Anne Orlando, we encounter the illusion of Guinevere in Dark Souls 1. Then, upon retrieving her soul, you can return it to her or transpose it into the Bountiful Sunlight Miracle, which reads, Special miracle granted by the Princess of Sunlight. The miracles of Guinevere, loved as both mother and wife, bestow their blessing on a great many warriors. So this is different than Soothing Sunlight that says it's granted to Maidens of Guinevere, but rather this is granted by none other than Guinevere herself. So connecting the dots to Rosaria's soul granting you a miracle only Guinevere grants, and the realization that Rosaria is indeed Guinevere isn't too difficult. Rosaria's bedchambers are even filled with the mirage-like aurora curtains only permitted for the old royal family. The obscuring ring tells us, it is said that Rosaria, the mother of Rebirth, was robbed of her tongue by her firstborn and has been waiting for their return ever since. Now, I don't think robbed of her tongue here has to mean she physically had her tongue removed. I'm not saying that that is the case for sure, but something to consider at least. But it says she was robbed of it by her firstborn. Fucking firstborns in Dark Souls, am I right? What's their damn deal? But... It could mean the firstborn walked up and cut her tongue out, or it could mean they did something that left Rosaria shocked and speechless, which could be symbolic about what I mentioned earlier about the queen disappearing quietly. The firstborn also could be that distant daughter, and that distant daughter could have done something cold enough to warrant some sort of vow of silence from Rosaria. But that bit isn't super important, just a curiosity I thought I'd lob your way. All right. So I did tell you that was a bit of a rabbit trail, now back to the Civil War and all that good jazz. So here's what I think went down, and there are a lot of moving pieces in Lothric, so I'll try to explain it as best I can while delving into the evidence I believe backs it up. I think the angelic faith arrived and offered a new outlook on the future, perhaps to some an even better one. As far as the people of Lothric were concerned, there was only one option find an heir to the flame, but now there was another one. The pillars argued amongst themselves and amongst the other pillars. By this time, the king of Lothric Osiris had gone mad in his research, providing yet another reason for people to doubt the known way. The Black Hand of the king's secret service, for all intents and purposes, was among those in talks of the future. The original faith of Lothric, which we'll refer to as the Way of White from here on out to avoid confusion, was clashing with the angelic faith. Individuals from all pillars sided with the angelic faith, and I even believe the High Priestess did as well. But not the High Priestess Emma that we meet in-game, the one before her, the one that was the wet nurse to Prince Lothric. People often mistake the stone hump tag in Dreg Heap to be Emma because it says she was the former wet nurse to royalty, but I don't believe Emma ever was the wet nurse. The Hag and Emma are both voiced by different actresses, which doesn't make sense if they are the same person, especially considering that just down the way is a new NPC that turns out to be someone we've already met, but both voiced by the same person. Also, in the old woman's ashes you get from the Hag, the Hand is seen wearing the High Priestess ring, where Emma was not. And, to top it off, the Hag is a Pilgrim of Londor, meaning she sided with ending the Age of Fire, whereas Emma did not. So the Hag, who was High Priestess at the time, also sided with the Angelic Faith, as did Rosaria, and I also believe the first of the Scholars did as well, who was, as many believe, was Pontiff Sullivan. But let me also say I don't truly believe Sullivan took any sides. If you've seen or read Game of Thrones, think of Sullivan as Littlefinger, playing whichever side he sees most advantageous and is only looking out for his own interest. But I think through the help of the Hag High Priestess, the one who did wet nurse Lothric, Sullivan was able to convince Prince Lothric not to link the flame, as we know the first scholar did which would have put a major hamper on the Way of White as they held all their faith in Lothric to play the savior. So the Way of White appointed a new high priestess and tried to re-strengthen the ties between the three pillars. 
we read in the Blessed Weapon description, the Knight is one of the three pillars of Lothric said to have strengthened ties with the High Priestess after the scholars acquired the Grand Archives. So the Way of White reformed as best they could and tried to strike at the source of the angelic faith, Gertrude. They took her into the newly scholar-acquired Grand Archives and locked her in a cell far at the top. And the Black Hand was not immune to this war either, and with their king gone crazy, I can't imagine they had an easy go of it. In fact, Black Hand Goddard attempted to flee the castle, perhaps in order to aid the angelic faith or aid the queen herself since the king had gone, but we can't know for sure as we find him dead on the steps of the Grand Archive. With the Way of White capturing Rosaria's daughter, she creates a Black Hand of sorts for her own. For what is a hand without its fingers? Yellowfinger Hazel, likely from the scholars, Longfinger Kirk, probably a knight, Ringfinger Leonard, well, I don't know about that guy, but you know what I mean. So the angelic faith needed to assault the archives to get Gertrude back. Just going through Lothric Castle to get to the archives, you can see that it looks like a war zone. There are barricades set up riddled with arrows, dead Lothric knights everywhere, other knights mourning their fallen comrades. We even see two winged knights in this area, one guarding a secret room. This secret room behind an illusory wall is actually quite interesting because in it lies a chest that contains the sacred bloom shield, which says, A treasured antique of the Way of White, known to some as the Sorcerer's Bane. The large blossom design that graces the shield is said to be a sacred flame, and the shield is blessed with high magic protection. Which makes perfect sense for the angelic faith to hang on to if they're planning on marching against the archives which is filled with sorcerers. And just past the archives is where we find Prince Lothric of Lorien, whom the queen would also want to protect. She may or may not have sent some of her fingers to do so, and perhaps Blackhand Gardard was one of them at some point and is the reason we find him dead. But guarding the last bit of the archives are three warriors. One is a Black Hand himself, the other Lionite Albert, who very likely resembles the Knight Pillar, and the Sorceress who may or may not represent the Scholar Pillar. But just past them is the long stair set to Prince Lothric's room, guarded by a handful of Lothric Knights donning blue tabards that indicates to me that they fight for the Angelic Faith. As well as on the roof to the archives, we find the Golden Winged Knights that are likely trying to rescue Gertrude or just covering her escape. And just below her empty cage, we find a Grub Man, an agent of Rosaria, not quite as efficient as her fingers though, standing wait. We also find a Grub Man dead in Irithyll. My guess of reasoning is that Rosaria sent them to find her children, Gertrude in the archives and the dancer in Irithyll. But that's just a guess, as there has to be a reason for them being there. Right outside Prince Lothric's doors, we can see statues that we've been seeing throughout Lothric, likely resembling the three pillars, yet here it seems that the knight and the scholar statues have been smashed, perhaps indicative of the angelic faith's alliance with the original high priestess. So Lothric was divided by the two faiths, one fought to preserve the Age of Fire, the other fought to end it. So it's hard to really say who won this war for sure, my guess though is with the angelic faith. Things look pretty grim for the Age of Fire and the Way of White. The world is in turmoil and begging for change. Londor and the angels offered them an out, and they took it. But that's just my interpretation of this very vague event with very vague findings. I hope you enjoyed it nonetheless though. And thanks so much everyone for watching. If you haven't subscribed already, I hope that you will. And of course, follow me on Twitter for all the latest news regarding videos and live streams. And drop a follow on Twitch for those live streams if you haven't already. All those links and more can be found down in the description below. I hope that you all have a wonderful rest of your day or evening. And thanks again for watching. Take care everyone. Until next time.